Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Um, this uh, presentation is part of my um, my role as the GSA ambassador. And when I was approached to do it, I, I couldn't say no because uh, the criteria for the, the award was that you had to be a mid-career researcher. And the only person who's more happy about me being a mid-career researcher is Chris Yates, who's two years older than me. So we're both a little bit surprised given I'm, I've just turned 50 in lockdown. So anyway, um, so, so I could have given it, I was told I could talk about anything I like and I, could have given uh, uh, a scientific talk about what I do or something like that, but but I think there's some more pressing issues in in geology, and I'm hopefully going to highlight some of them um, to this audience. And those issues have flow-on effects, um, as you'll see, not just into uh, the university sector where I work, um, but also into GSA membership, etc. And we saw from um, those attended the national meeting earlier this month, last month now. Um, the finances of the GSA are great. Uh, the, the membership is uh, not as, not as uh, vibrant or as well off as, as I guess many would like. So, and there's probably reasons for that. And, and we're just gonna explore those. So last time I gave this talk to a, a GSA audience, some, of them, some people got really upset with me um, because they thought I was talking about um, the resource sector and how inappropriate it is. And that's not what this talk's about. This talk will be about one thing only, which is um, perception. And so we'll get, we'll get, okay. yeah. Yeah, my computer won't drive. <laughs> oh no, next screen. This is gonna work away. Okay, so look, as a species, we're great at, uh, we're great at consuming things. It's actually, it's actually frightening. Um, here's a slide that I just stole from somewhere now. You know, we, we used to consume $550 each equivalent in uh, 600 years ago um, per person. There was only $250 uh, um, billion dollars worth of goods used then. The population was much less. Now we nearly had 8 billion people. And as a, as a population, we consume $8,800 um, worth of goods and services each year. So we have this insatiable appetite for um, materials. Some of that's driven because countries are trying to develop themselves, so China for example. Others like developed countries, we're consumers and we will continue to be so. So this is not about, um, about goods and services. We, this is the way it is. It will be this way for a long period of time. But this is a challenge I think that's societal and much greater despite my mum's arguments than finding a cure for cancer. Our resources are our future and we have to resolve them. Our experience as geologists also dictates the way we describe ourselves. So I want you, everyone in, who's listening to think about why you're an earth or environmental scientist. I gave this talk class to a group of students who are also environmental. So, so what was the drivers to become that? Many of you in the room, it was a while ago, for some of us it was quite a while ago as well. And some people who are in the room are who are still thinking about why they might want to be a geologist. But it usually comes down to four things. It's a lifestyle. Some of us love that. That was the reason I chose it. Others have got a more altruistic um, view of it, but I, but I would say less so. Others in the past have been largely in, influenced by the career opportunities, and I'll, I'll put that as money. And then, of course, there's other ones. So it's curious because that, that experience and the reasons why you do it often tends to drive the way you talk about your discipline area. So when I was in my early career, I really, I grew up in the country in, a, in a East Ken and East Gippsland and I was the son of a plumber and a hairdresser. I actually liked the outdoors. My dad wanted me to be a plumber. I also nearly became a butcher in year 10 and now I'm a professor in earth sciences. So your pathways take you a long way. But my driver was I liked the outdoors. And despite having several can can cancers cut off my skin in my in my late forties, etc., um, you know that was that was the, that was my main driver. I wanted a job that took me outdoors, and I had no handyman genes, so I, I wasn't going to become a plumber. Much to my dad's disgust, 
I also like the travel that it afforded me. There's a photo of me when I'm in fatter days, and uh, but also when I'm, my hips allowed me to climb higher mountains, and uh, that's in the Yukon Territories. You actually, as a career, you get to see amazing things and stuff that people don't generally get to see. And, and we kind of take it for granted, but um, it is a pretty special thing about our jobs. I think it's a forensic science. And what I mean by that is we deal with data sets that are difficult to difficult because they're sparse, they're clustered, and, uh, and all the information's not always there. And, and geologists get to make decisions that based on that, and often those decisions, if you go out and work in industry, are, 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 are costly. So you've got lots of responsibility with other people's money on incomplete information. So you actually become a really good decision maker, in my opinion. I think it's got a great career. I think it's got, it's diverse. It's, you know, I'm a professor. I didn't want to be, I never wanted to be an academic and somehow 20 years later I've landed there. I, you know, I wouldn't swap it out now, but that's the way it is. And I don't, can't tell, I can't tell my uh, students that because they get really annoyed with me because they desperately want to be academics and they know their pathway there is fought with uh, uncertainty. And of course we get paid well. Later on in my career, I learned a bunch of things about myself that actually took me into my current role. I'm Associate Dean of Graduate Research. I look after a PhD program inside a faculty. And I only spend 50% of my life as a geologist, but I'm really good at solving problems. And I'm actually really good at solving people problems as well, which are more complex than rocks. Um, the data I get to make decisions on is sparse as well. And even though it's a different type of data set, I'm really good at I'm, I'm doing that. Good synthesizing data. It's, I'm dealing with ambiguity all the time. Many of my colleagues from other faculties are not comfortable with it. They don't like it. Because I'm a geologist, I'm completely comfortable with it. And I like dealing with people. And of course, if you're geo, you're either, you're either out by yourself or you're, or you're dealing in teams. So all the skills I learned in my early in my career have been completely transferable. So that's my narrative. But is that the way the rest of the society views us? And I guess that's one of the questions I've got. Oh, this is my favourite slide. Geologists were created to, as engineers need heroes as well. But, but at the end of the day, that's my perception of me. This me at, at, in Patagonia, in Mount Isa, with my undergraduate mates, teaching, etc. But it's not always like that. And I guess if I asked you guys how you perceived yourselves, you would have a different narrative to me. But it would be but largely dictated by your experiences and your pathway in life. And and, and I think we need to think about that when we communicate to young people. So, so this slide really is the spiel that, that I think we are. You know, if I had to cover us off, I think earth system scientists, geologists, environmental scientists, geophysicists, oceanographers have a, should have a profound influence on society. And I think it's underestimated at the moment. Our origin, our climate, that we that we uh, that we influence the resources that we consume, the natural hazards we face. We're all the stewards of these. No one else in society knows these things. My dog's going crazy in, at, at my bedroom door, um, and I think these are much bigger societal issues. These societal issues are much bigger than society understands. Um, and the medical scientists get get the get the prizes because they are seen to solve the more, most important issues. But, but medical sciences solves problems for individuals and we get ignored because we solve problems for society. And individuals don't even recognise those problems exist in many ways. So if we want to have a sustainable future, we really, um, we really have to change the way we, we communicate ourselves. And I think there's some, some low-lying fruit that I'll talk about in a minute related to that. Of course, I went and did a little pop survey to my children and and my mother so several generations and their perception of geology is is actually very different to mine and and I think that and their and their perception it's not just my children is that we're actually dirty science okay and it's brutal because we're the, we're the science that actually we're the stewards of the future and yet society thinks this is low tech dirty and part of the problem, not part of the solution. And that's, that's, for me, that's a hard pill to swallow. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about why, why we got to this point. So I've, I've covered this slide off, but it basically is, there's a disconnect between 
you know, one of the disconnects that really does exist, and I think we're getting there slowly, but we actually have to do and work much harder, is the connect between the, the need for resources to transition away from fossil fuels into alternative energies. And that, that disconnect is there. We, I, I mark happens in Melbourne every year in November. There's thousands of kids basically protesting out the front against the mining sector, demanding that we go into a, 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 an energy future that looked different to what it is. And they, and they simply didn't understand what they were protesting against was actually what they needed. I think there's an unspoken dread of science. I'm gonna show you some slides in a minute that really does it. So it's a little bit scary for people and it's because we get excited by that scariness. And, and you know, the White Island um, eruption late last year where people got caught on it, really highlights the vulnerability. If you wind the clock back a decade, it's the tsunami that basically um, smashed up against Japan. You know, every time there's a volcanic eruption, a pyroclastic flow, these things, you know, these things play into people's minds. We're, we're less affected in Australia because we sit in the middle of a plate, so it's less so, but um, they, they do it. I don't think our, the way we communicate aligns ourselves with the Generation Z's um, objectives and expectations. We talk a lot about salaries and how good they are in geoscience. These kids don't care. They actually don't. They don't care about their salary. They actually want a purpose. And that's one of the key points I want to make. And unfortunately, I think we're seen as the domain of a middle-aged white bearded guys who look for profits instead of the future. And that's the perception. It's not, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the reality, but that's how my kids see it. Okay, and, and, and there's probably reasons in the way we communicate for that. So are we a threatened species? I, the, the Australian uh, Institute of Geoscientists did a survey um, a few years ago now, looking at student numbers. And this is, kind of the, this is kind of the root of the problem, right? So, and what they discovered was, and I'm just gonna see if I can get my, my pointer up, hang on. Pointer options, laser pointer. Someone taught me this the other day. So, so cool, right? Um, is that our, our, our PhD completions have been going up and up and up and up. And that's, a, that's, a, that's really a function of the way universities behave and, and the money that's been pushed into that part of it. There was a, a, a correlation made between mineral exploration expenditure and, and student numbers and it dies off. And, 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 and at face value, you see that you know, students fall away two years after money starts to stop being, expending in Australia. And, and of course, we exonerated ourselves at that moment. We said our student numbers are diving 33% because the mineral sector's not um, providing a, a, a career path for them. And so what that mean in the, it meant, meant in the university and schools like the one I'm in, Earth, Atmosphere and Environment, so we're, she'll be right, the numbers will pick up in the next boom. Okay, I'm gonna tell you a little, uh, what's going on now. Half the third year curriculum is cut in at University of Melbourne and Monash University. COVID driven, but we set ourselves up for a fall because we didn't act upon these. And that's not public knowledge. I'm telling you that because it's, uh, it's what's on its way. Let's look at Britain. They don't have a mineral sector. So they don't, they're, not, they're not subservient to a, a, a mining boom bus cycle like we are. And their numbers that have fallen off in the same period of time 33% less enrolments, exactly the same. You go look at the US data, the same. There's something more going on about geology than just the boom bust cycle of the mineral sector. And what this number tells you, a third across three of the biggest geology nations in, in, in the world, is that geology is on the nose with young people. And they don't want to do it, and it's a problem. So Let's have a look at some more data. Here's, um, here's Trent um, from Ian Stewart, who's up there in the corner. He's the started that he collected, basically, uh, you know, the software that does it. It shows a normalised vertical axis of zero to 100, so 100 to 100% searches. And, and the searches are for the word geology in Google. So our peak for Google searches for the word geology was 2004. And in that time, it's dropped off by 80%. 
brutal. Okay, the blue line that's pulsating up and down, that's China. Okay, the rest of the numbers are the rest of the world. And when I looked at that data, I was like, oh, surely that's not right. And then of course, some of my colleagues went, no, 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 you'll be sweet, you're wrong. You know, they're just searching for the word geophysics or oceanography or environmental science. That may be the case that the word geology has an 80% fall off in the searches on Google. That's data and that's global data. You can't argue that, it's frightening. Here's the dread stuff that I talk about. This is a study, I can't remember, I should have cited it. But it basically shows all the things that I put in blue stars that relate to geology in some way. And there's the unknowns and the knowns and the low dread and the high dread. So drinking coffee has a low dread and, and, it's, uh, and it sits roughly between the effects of it being known and unknown. So it sits way down there. But all the, all the geology things like fossil fuels and uranium mining, radioactive waste, coal mining, etc., large dams, and there's others, I've listed them in the green, all have high dread factor. Okay, and there's some of the things we know lots about, like, you know, we actually know what coal mining does. But even though that's, and it's, and, and it's safe in general, do you know what I mean? And so, but it sits up there in the high dread zone. So it's really, really interesting to see how people perceive that from a, from a sort of a fear factor. So I'll keep going. I also attended a conference which really sh shocked me um, last year. It was an Auslan education conference. And, and basically, um, there was HR people in, in, the, in the big corporates saying, well, we don't know what our future looks like in terms of our job market. We, don't know, we actually don't know. And then, and then in the next breath, I was saying, we expect the universities tr to train the next generation. And I stuck my hand up and I said, well, come on guys, how, how can you tell the universities are, are like the Titanic, they take about, you know, 50 kilometres to turn around. So, you know, how are you going to, uh, how are we going to change the job market with that? But the, but the reality was that the problem is not at the universities or even at the GSA, it's actually about what the kids want before they get to university. You know, the low student numbers are not driven by a poor first year curriculum or second year curriculum. They're driven by kids who just don't want to do geology. Okay, so these are the things that I think are, are, are playing at, at each other. So kids see mining and, and geology as part of the problem and, and they see it as a dirty industry. They're the red boxes. The geology departments are closing and mergers caused by low numbers and then there's this there's this tension that exists in universities between are we supposed to train geologists for their careers or are we supposed to train scientific geologists for, you know, to do a PhD? And there is, you know, there's no doubt that in universities, there's an element of grooming that goes on where you get the most talented second year and you put your arm around them and you walk them into their PhD, okay? And I have argued that that is not good behaviour, okay? And then at the industry sector, it's like, what are our skills and what are our numbers and what does it look like? And so if you jumble those six boxes in together, it's a mess. And, and, and by 2029, so what's that? Nine years time, 50% of our global workforce will be millennials or younger, and there'll be no baby boomers and very few generation Xs in the, in the workforce. Okay, so our workforce will be looking very different to what it does now. Look, these are the characteristics. I, you know, most of us intuitively know this, but it's actually, um, it's a surprise to, to many people. So if you want to, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to inspire a, a, a Gen Z, you basically need to give them a purpose. Okay, and that purpose is usually around something that's socially responsible, human-centred and ethical. This is not my words, these are studies that come out there. There's so many papers on this, that's not funny. They want to contribute to the, the changing human lives. They don't sometimes understand what that means or looks like, but that's the motivation. And unlike myself as a Gen X, who is completely motivated by toys, you know, I love, I love my Mustang, who drinks V8, is a V8, drinks lots of petrol, I love that, right? Unlike me, they're not mo motivated by material goods, they're actually motivated by purpose. So we have to give them meaningful 
career paths that they want to embrace. And we don't, they're not interested in salaries at this stage. Now I'm going to, my last slide might change some of that. So how do we, so how do we message ourselves and how do other people and other, other disciplines message ourselves? So here's a, here's a basically a website from, I think this one's from the USA actually, but it's basically one of those ones that parents go with their kids that are 15 and they go, what does a job like this look like? And it, if you just look at the blue section, you can be working from home and traveling around on an annual basis. You could be doing desk work, field work, and combinations thereof. These, this is a sentences that environmental scientists sell their, their task. They're saying your world could be anything and we're super flexible in the way you do it. That's, that's the message there. I, I, makes me want to be an environmental scientist, doesn't it, when you read those words. Look at us, geologists, geophysicists and hydrogeologists. We'll study the composition, locate and advise, detect and monitor, and you have tasks that you do. This is from the Australian government website. We describe when we want kids who are 15 looking for potential career paths, we describe boring tasks to them. And so any wonder, even if they thought there was an altruistic career path in, in geology, you ex explain what they do and you go, actually, I, could, I think I'll go become environmental science or so I might become something else. Okay, it's pretty brutal, but it actually is true. So the difference in those two messaging is what you could be versus stuff you will do. That's the messaging that's the difference between those two websites. I would argue you actually need to put a purpose in there as well as, as, and a significance message. So as an Australian government, if we want more geologists, we have to put a purpose rather than what we do and the significance of why we would do it. And the lowest lying fruit for that is this transition that I talked about. It's, so, it's such a no brainer. And I don't, I don't, you know, it's, it's like we should be doing it. Actually, interesting, the BHP big think big ad campaign with a massive mind that I thought was a disaster. The next iteration of that is we need copper for the future, right? It's, a, it's an improvement on that messaging. I'm not going to talk about the details of it, but, you know, all the critical metals that we're super worried about because, because other countries have, have um, a monopoly on those things are actually the things that we need to be focusing on. And, and, and turning our work, workforces in geosciences away from employing um, a coal miner to uh, someone who will explore for uh, gallium and lithium. We as individuals also make crucial mistakes when we communicate. I'm a shocker, what do you do? I interpret aeromagnetic data, the Earth's magnetic field, blah, 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 blah. If someone in a pub listens to me, I send them, you know, I'm a cure for insomnia in some ways, right? Because I'm really passionate about what I do, but, at the end of the day, an average punter doesn't care what you do, they want to know why you do it. It's a utterly different message. So what we all do as geologists, we tell the person when they ask us what we do, we tell them in the nth detail about what we do. And instead of that doing that, we should be telling them why we're doing it. And then if they're more interested, then they might ask you something you can tell them in detail. That's, and that is, I would argue that's 100% of all geoscientists make that mistake when they communicate. We can't help ourselves. We just have, we're so passionate about what we do that we just, we, we just, we go straight to the detail instead of the reasons why. Communication number stick, which is the alarmist, the sky's falling down. Did you know we're gonna run out of copper in the next 20 years? Yeah, peak minerals, peak, yeah. And that message is actually frightening for people as well. It contributes to the dread but also you imagine when you walk down the street and you come across some uh, religious group that's telling you about what you're talking, uh, telling you that the earth is going to end because of their beliefs. Do you go and talk to them or do you run away in the opposite direction? And I know exactly the answer to this. I know what I do. I run in the opposite direction. And I'm wondering whether we, when we sell that message, whether we're actually not, um, we're causing people to not wanting to listen. They actually don't want to hear that message. So they run in the opposite direction. And I think this one's uh, the other one I hear a lot is, 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 you know, you should be grateful for the mining sector because we contribute 21% of the GDP. It's only the mining sector that talks like this. You don't go into a retail shop and have some, someone who works in retail go, you should be grateful for retail because we contribute 26% of the GDP. Which is bizarre. It's actually needy, in my opinion. 
Okay, and, and, and what you're saying is to the, someone who's skeptical about the science who thinks it's dirty is that you're linking wealth and greed to mining. So it's sending the opposite message that you, that you actually think it's sending. It's really interesting the way the psychology of these messages work. So this is the last couple of slides. It's really, you know, I don't want to be too negative about it because I do love geology, but, it, but, I do, but I do think we need to work together and to just, I think when we talk about ourselves, we need to talk about why we do geosciences. And that can be a personal experience. I just love going out in the outdoor and seeing stuff that no one else gets to see, or could be a more altruistic message about the need for transitioning our economy into a, a greener and renewable energy, and, and we need to have resources. Focus on the purpose, not on the tasks. We talked about that. The narrative should be run, run around positive change and not about the negatives, i.e. we're gonna run out of things. And how geoscience is part of the solution, something is fundamental for the way we need to change our perceptions. And, and we can talk about the challenges that society faces and how ge geology addresses them. And please avoid the details. Bruce, no one wants to know that you interpret seismic data to the, to the Maho. <laughs> okay, so, so societies have a role to play in this, and this is part of the, the, the G up, I call it, which is what, what we have to do, right? So. I think we need a, co a consistent message from, from society and we need to actually pick our target audiences that are not ourselves, right? We get the message and we get the joke, right? And I look and all the all the messaging I get, all sorry, all the, you know, all the all the divisions I go to, the most engaged people are the are, are, are the senior members of the society. And and we have to find strategies to get younger people more engaged. I don't think anyone's arguing with me on that. And, and in order for that to happen, we have to have a purpose for those younger people. I think we have to stop showing pictures of hard hats and, and Tonka trucks and big holes in the ground. I think that's, you know, I think when students get to third year, they accept that that's, that's the go because they understand more, but actually to market ourselves, um, we have to do better. And we certainly should say, stop saying we're high tech industry and start showing drones because my 11 year old thinks a drone is a Christmas present. Okay, I think we have, we have to communicate our societal purpose and we have to stop talking to ourselves and start talking to others. Um, and I think it's a collective effort. And I think, it's somewhat, I think we have to organize ourselves in a way that the GSA, for example, the Australian Institute of Geoscientists, the universities have a, have a real clear um, message that comes consistently into, into, into younger people. And that may mean spending money to the masses, advertising or something like that. I don't, have a, I don't know, you know what the purpose is, but it's no point having myself or Steve Hill going in and talking to high school kids. And I'll tell you why, because Steve and I are old enough to be their dads. Okay, and so they, they automatically think you're a prize idiot. So you have to take the younger and more engaged people and put them into the high schools. I'm happy to be the 50 year old who gives everyone the G up, that's my role. But actually at the end of the day, this is, this is what's required. So we have to pick the people that we wanna do the engaging with so that we get the most listening happening. So the caveat to this is COVID. When I, when I first did this slide, caveat, COVID didn't exist, right? And we have to think about this, right? So, so there's definitely go, you know, I get a sense as a, a, a societal attitude change to science. You know, there's suddenly a, a greater trust in scientists apart from the fringe elements of, you know, conspiracy theories and rightfully so. Okay, so this is an opportunity, you know, and this is on the back of the bushfires, et cetera. So people are in, in the mood to pay attention to scientists, probably for the first time in 25 years. I've talked about the purpose and, and the drivers for Gen Z, and of course with, with, with COVID, there's a greater uncertainty and anxiety around this. So, you know, there may be attitudinal changes to employment and career paths that I haven't considered in this talk. And we need to, we need to, we actually need to pay attention to this as well, because for example, a secure job might become, and a less paying job might become more valued than an insecure job that pays a greater hourly rate, for example. 
you know, the other thing we need to think about is, you know, we're going to go through a 10 year period of economic recovery at some point, and it's probably going to be a slow burn and there's probably going to be some significant drivers to that. We want to be part of that economic recovery and, and our story needs to be, um, and our narrative needs to be an integral part of that. Of course, how does this play out in the education space? And it's critical because I, you know, I'm really fearful for geoscience departments at the moment because, you know, the university sector is, you know, billions of dollars short. They're looking to remove staff and, and the low lying fruit is courses with low student numbers. That's the reality. Um, I'll leave it at that for now, but we want to be paying attention to that and, uh, and be very careful about it. And I'm not trying to def, you know, protect my patch or anything like that. I'm just saying this is a reality, right? And of course, once you start cutting back courses and or um, you know, disciplines, then there's a pathway into that career path that no longer exists. We found that out in the early, in early 1990s when we lost 15 departments and we could be going through phase two of that. Um, and so well, all this, might, this last point is really saying um, is that we, you know, we, with COVID, we may need to pivot again. So, and we, might, and we will want to be nimble is what, I, what I'm saying. So um, we just need to be careful about that. I'm going I'm to leave it there. I just, really, I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't want to be too negative and I know I do come across because people have told me. Um, I, I, Sue uh, Fletcher was mortified when she first heard this talk. I, I think it's super critical. So I, I don't want to mince my words, but at the same time, you know, We've got such a great science that we, we should be able to, um, to turn this around if we, if we work together on this. So I'll leave it for that and, and thanks everyone for listening.